Hey, what's going on, everyone? My name is Matt Jarbo. This is Three Buck Theater. And with Solo only a few weeks away, it's weird to think that we're about five weeks away from this movie coming out. Disney and Lucasfilm are getting ready to start doing a major marketing push. But one of the interesting things that they did is they released a little video that talked about the characters and some new vehicles to give you a better, I guess, look, a better understanding, a better idea as to what to expect from this new movie, considering the fact that it's the second spinoff film and that it's set, you know, prior to A New Hope, uh, probably before even uh, Rogue One. However, I wouldn't really be surprised if they find some way to kind of tie it all together, but they want to make sure that these new characters are going to be able to be, I guess you could say, known and loved in their own right, probably to really help push merchandising. But uh, but anyway, I wanted to take a brief look to see how these things break down because uh, I'm excited for the movie, regardless of all the problems. I, I, I'm i always going to want to see a Star Wars movie. I'm always going to go in with high expectations, and uh, I'm curious to know more. So over here, uh, we have the solo Star Wars story character descriptions. And first up, we have got Val played by Thandie Newton, uh, who is an amazing, wonderful actress. I love her very much. I've loved her ever since I saw her back in, uh, what was it, Gridlocked with Tupac Shakur and Tim Roth from the 90s. And uh, her in Westworld is great. Her addition to this is going to also be good. She plays Val, a no-nonsense and occasionally prickly woman who is a crack shot with a blaster rifle. Val may be the most even-headed and capable member of Tobias Beckett's ragtag group of scoundrels. And that's pretty cool. Uh, we get to see a badass, kick-ass Pam Greer 1970s-esque type character. And and I think actually when it comes to the idea of, you could say, inclusion, diversity, and representation, getting that type of character is it's pretty cool. I'm a I'm a big Pam Grew fan personally. So like I'm anything that can kind of embody that mindset, I'm all down for. Uh what we got now is Tobias Beckett, played by Woody Harrelson, saying he is a survivor, always quietly working out angles to come out ahead. He's assembled a team of specialized scoundrels to carry out risky but profitable heists. And of course, this is the dude you know who's going to be like the mentor. He's a guy who found Han Solo when he was young and he was like the Oliver Twist type character and he helped mold him and shape him. Think, think Yondu and, and Peter Quill, right, from Guardians. That's kind of what I'm taking from this one right here. Uh, and, of course, there's that train heist we know of from seeing in the trailers, and I think that's going to be the, the, you know, the big job they're trying to pull. Then we've got uh, Kira, played by Amelia Clark, saying at 18, age, 18 years of age, young Kira is already immersed in a life of crime working for a gang on Corellia. Now, this one's a little bit weird to me, and I say that simply because Amelia Clark is not 18 years old. She's clearly in her mid to late 20s at this point. Uh, trying to portray her as being 18 doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, Harrison Ford himself was in his 30s. I think he was 34 when they filmed the movie. And so if this takes place before then, who knows how long before then, he might be in his late 20s, early 30s. And based upon the trailer, we know that they were in uh, the, you know, the Imperial Academy together, you know, and, and they, they did joyriding. So I don't think 18 years young at this point is where she's at. I think when he first meets her, she's 18. I think he's also 18 and then years pass and then she gets herself caught up uh, working uh, for a gang on Corellia. That's kind of what I, that's that's my interpretation of how things are going to go. Then we've got Rio Durant here. Rio has carried out dangerous operations alongside scoundrel Tobias Beckett for years. The good-natured Ardenian pilot is up for any challenge. And this, this particular character, I just love the design of and I really want to see more um, from him. I want to know I want the, the, the ragtag group of scoundrels that are going to carry out these heists uh, are interesting to me. Like they I, I want to know more about who they are. Uh, and I look forward to seeing that in, in the movie uh, and probably also a, a stuff that's expanded upon the novelization. Now, we've also got uh, L337. Now, this particular character, based upon the description here, a self-made droid built from an astromech and protocol parts, L337 is an enlightened navigator who cares deeply about droid rights. So previously, when I mentioned the representation of Val's character and having that type of uh, character, a, a strong female uh, black woman, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. A strong black woman character in these uh, in this movie is probably going to do well for that kind of representation. Here we're going to be talking about droid rights, and that's something that hasn't been even remotely discussed when it comes to Star Wars, right? Like we we know from watching A New Hope that C three PO and R two D two were captured by the Jawas. The Jawas therefore put you know security uh, bolts on the droids. They sell them off into basically indentured servitude, uh, and that was that's the thing. And we know that R two D two and C three PO have 
have personalities and they grow and they care. So you almost want to sit there and look at this from the perspective of droids have feelings. Droids can grow to have feelings. They can grow to love their masters uh, or vice versa or just become their own independent nature. Look at K K2SO from Rogue One, right? Alan Tudyk did a great job bringing that character to life, brought a lot of heart, a lot of humor, a lot of love that when he died in the movie, my girlfriend let out an audible, no, like... So if, if, if that's an angle they're taking with this, I'm actually kind of curious to see what happens. Unlike Harry Potter, they, they avoided it in the movies, but in the books, Hermione was going on about elf, you know, elf rights and everything else and trying to free all the elves and Hogwarts and everything. Uh, and, and that was kind of a, 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 a subplot in the books that never made it into the movies. I'm wondering, though, how kind of on the on the. Um, Eh, on the on the nose this is going to be you know and if, if it's if it's handled in a way that doesn't come across as too preachy audiences are going to uh are going to work with it if it comes across as something that's far too preachy uh they're 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 going to lose interest pretty freaking quick so that that's going to be something that is going to uh be um well, interesting nonetheless. Uh, then we got down here, we have Imperial Patrol Troopers. This is a new one. Uh, these guys looked a little bit different. We didn't see them in any of the other movies. I always find it funny when they go and they do these prequels. They do this in games too, but when they, they do these prequels and then they bring out like this new tech, this new gear, and you're just like, where the hell was that? Like, look at the prequels to Star Wars. CG, everything, you know, new, everything was sleek and not boxy looking, but then 30 years down the road, it all went to shit, right? So... <laughs> It's just, it's funny to me. Um, now, as the Empire reinforces its hold on worlds across the galaxy, local defense forces are being supplemented and eventually completely replaced with Imperial Stormtroopers. To cover distances, sprawling settlements and cities, patrol Stormtroopers, police the streets and alleys uh, ab aboard their swift interceptor speeder bikes. So the speeder bikes clearly look different than they did in, in Return of the Jedi. There's also been uh, many, many, many years to kind of re redefine or redesign the, the bike. But what I like about this, though, is this, this touch is upon the clone troopers being phased out and then this the conscription that was coming in with stormtroopers in order to basically just bring in uh whoever they can get to train them young and, and become the stormtroopers like that's an interesting uh little tidbit there that was brought up uh, you've also got here the Imperial Heavy TIE Fighter, compensating for the relative fragility of the unshielded uh, TIE Starfighter. The armored TIE RB is reinforced Heavy Starfighter uh, with much more powerful laser cannons. And again, going back to my previous point, where the hell was this thing? You know, during the original trilogy, right? Like this sort of thing would have been there because all we really got were TIE Fighters, TIE Bombers, and TIE Interceptors. Right. So now we've got this is heavy TIE fighter. And it's like, again, it's that it's that, oh, technology we had before. Now it's kind of coming into play. I mean, look at the Rogue One where they had that little thing with the shield or, or tracking someone in, in uh, through uh, hyperspace. And then that was, you know, 30 years earlier. And the technology was what the what the First Order was using in uh, the you know, in the last Jedi, these these kind of leaps when it comes to the technology and how things play out get a little bit old, but okay, um, it looks cool and I'm willing to go with it. Uh, we got the Imperial Conveyx Transport for rapid transport of special cargo uh, cross service distances on frontier worlds. The Empire uses heavily armored Conveyx vehicles that travel long rails, winding through treacherous terrain. This, of course, is going to be one of the big set pieces of the movie, the train heist. It looks pretty badass. I want to see what they do with it. And so, again, I have I have nothing against that because we, we never really saw a lot of what happened with some of the worlds in the Empire and what they were building. Um, and then finally, what we've got is a Carillion M8 land speeder. Now, now, obviously, Luke's land speeder is a, an iconic part of pop culture from A New Hope. But uh, here, Han gets his own one, saying Han Solo was cagey about where he scored this overpowered M8 land speeder, saying little beyond its previous owner had no longer had a need for it. So that is kind of where we stand right now with the characters in uh, in, in Star Wars or Solo, a Star Wars story. And I, I think it gives us a little bit of a little bit of information about what to expect out of them, a little bit of information about where things might go with the characters and just giving us a, a look at the varied cast. And that's cool with me. Like one of the things uh, I liked about Rogue One was, you know, it was a, it was kind of like a mishmash team of people. And I, I grew to like the characters uh, the further the film progressed, as also the more times I watched it. And I have a feeling that's going to be done here here as well um having the fact that it's it's you know a, a varied group in terms of not only uh gender but uh species is going to i think really speak to a lot of people out there who want to see that kind of representation now there is going to probably be a bit of pushback from certain people out there like the down with disney's treatment of fanboys and star wars whatever the hell those that alt-right group 
they uh, they're going to come out there and say, oh, we don't want SJW stuff in Star Wars. None of this is SJW unless they beat you over the head with it. And that is one of the hardest parts about discussing this kind of content is it's not social justice warrior nonsense. It's not identity politics or cultural politics um, unless they beat you over the head with it. Having a character that's into droid rights could be skirting that line because they made sure to mention it. That was something they wanted to include. But ultimately, it's it's not going to be everything and i think people who go in expecting it to be like that are going to see it i think that's just they go in for confirmation bias and no matter what they're going to get angry over it if it's just having these characters and that's that cool beans man cool beans but if they go too far and they make you know they stop the movie dead in its tracks to push a political narrative then yes those people will have every right to be upset but at the in the meantime we don't know yet what exactly that is we don't know yet what that's going to be uh we won't know for five more weeks but i want to know your guys' thoughts about this do these characters sound interesting do you give a crap? Do you not give a crap? Uh, where are you at with this movie? Let me know in the comments below. My name, of course, is Matt Jarbo. This has been Three Buck Theater. If you haven't already, thumbs it up. Subscribe to the channel. Check back often for more content to me. Like, click that bell, seriously, because YouTube's screwing everyone this week. And if you just want to see more, and I hope you do, you can do so right now.